With our voices, we praise you. With a clap, we praise you. With everything that is on the inside of us, we give you all the praise because you are such a good God and we are so aware of your goodness. We stand in awe of your goodness tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. So I want you, wherever you are, I understand your hands might be a little clammy or a little sweaty. So maybe don't use the hands. Just look at somebody and be like, you're welcome. I see you. God loves you. God loves you. Tonight's your night. Yeah? Hallelujah. I want to take a moment to welcome. You may take your seats right here in house. I want to take a moment to welcome every single person who is connected with us tonight, wherever you are watching from. It doesn't matter if you are British or American or African. It really, really, truly doesn't matter or anywhere in the, in the entire world, really. God loves you and he has an encounter for you today. I want you to be expectant. I want you right there where you are to engage with everything that happens. When you see us dance, when you see us sing, when you see us lift our hands, I want you to lift your hands to your God because he is for you. And let me tell you something, the same God who began a good work on the inside of you 
you will see it to completion in the name of Jesus. And it is the same for every single one of you that is in this place tonight. I want you, as we engage, as we continue the proceedings of tonight, I want you to have so much expectation that you are here not for a program. You are here not to listen to anyone who sings beautifully, which they do. Love you, girls. We're here for an encounter with the living God. We're here to encounter Him one-on-one. We're here to know Him as our God. We're here because we're His people. We're His sheep. We're the sheep of His pasture. And our God has been so good to us. He's been so good that we would think our praise is better reserved for anyone else. He is way too good for us to come into this place And to not leave everything at the altar, to not lay everything at the altar, to not say, God, this is me. You have my attention. You have my affection. So please, as as they would say in Kosa, Kululeka, okay, be free, be at home. This is the presence of the Most High God, but it's the presence of your Father. It's the presence of your King. And we're here for him today. We're here to encounter the living God. So I wanted to share something with every single one of you this evening. How many people have their Bibles here? I can partially see right now. Yes. Okay, I see some waves. If you you wave an envelope. Oh, I see. I see some waves. Okay. I'm glad you do. How many people have a digital Bible in the house tonight? Okay, that's a lot more people. How many people don't have a Bible here tonight? Okay, so the person next to them, I need you to hold them accountable. Just raise your hand one more time. It's nice, it's in the dark, no one can see you. But raise your hand one more time and whoever's around them, I need you to hold them accountable. Find out what is it. Do you lack the data to download it? You hotspot them if you need to. Perhaps they don't have space in their phone. Please delete those games. We see you. We see you with those games on your phone and those social media apps, okay? Make room. Make room for an encounter. Make room for God to do something. Give him something to work with, okay? Then there was light. So, will you turn with me to the book of John? The gospel according to John. Johan. Johanne. I don't know any other languages for John. Hmm? I said, Johanne. So, (laughs) will you turn with me to the book of John? Are you there? We're going to the 19th chapter. Anybody there? Should we play a competition? No, let's not. Are you there? Okay. In the book of John, chapter 19, from verses 28 to 30, the heading or um, the title of that portion of Scripture actually speaks about it is finished. This is when Jesus was on the cross. Let me tell you. So this is what John, 8, um, John 19, 28 to 30 says. It says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop. So when we're talking about sour wine, we're talking vinegar, all right? So they, 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 they put it on hyssop and then they, they, they put it into, they put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So regardless of what had happened, the work was finished and he is the one who gave up his spirit. He's the one who said, I've done what I came here to do. And when you hear the words, it is finished. There's a, there's a Greek word for that. Um, there's one single word. We say it in English in three, but there's one single word and it is called tetelestai. And other people say titilistai, depending where you come from. But what that means, that's, that's like me looking at you and I have an assignment to do. And then I look at you and I say, okay, I'm all done now. Mission accomplished. That's another way of saying it's the end. 
I've done what I was supposed to do with this assignment. I've fulfilled. I have completed exactly what it is that I was supposed to do. Now you may ask, okay, what was the assignment? Was it just death on the cross? Well, I'm sure you've seen in the Bible where Jesus would often teach or would often share how the Son of Man came to or the Son of Man did not come to, right? How many have seen that in the text? Now, one of the key components of what he said when he was talking about himself, the Son of Man, in Luke 19, 10, he said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, we're going to do a flashback Friday all the way to the garden. I don't know if those still exist, but carry on with me. All the way to the garden, when Jesus, when God made man, His intention was that he would walk in unbroken fellowship with us. So his intention, you read in the Bible how he walked with Adam in the cool of the day. And how when he made him, when he finally made man, he saw, geez, this is very, very good. And then he empowered him and gave him an assignment or an instruction and said, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, have dominion. I want you to fill the earth. I want you to take exactly what I've given to you and I want you to multiply it. What that means is regardless of whether or not at that moment Adam realized it, he actually possessed all that he needed to fulfill the God-given mandate, right? So through sin, you know, in Genesis 3, They see something, Eve sees something that she thinks, oh, Jesus is lovely. And the enemy kind of pulls a trick on her. But she looks at this thing and she thinks, this thing is so much better than what I think God has for me. This thing is just so good. It's so pleasing to the eyes. I really think I'm missing out. So FOMO has Eve and she's finally like, you know what? I'm giving in. I want to see. Essentially, the enemy pulled a number on her and said, Here's an opportunity to possess something that God has not already given you. Meanwhile, when God made them, he said, I'm giving you everything. I'm empowering you with everything that you need. I'm going somewhere. Hang on. So Jesus comes to seek and to save the lost. That's not to seek and to, it's actually to seek and to save that which was lost. What that is, is the very dominion that you and I from the very beginning were created with. Jesus came and he said, listen, I know you gave it to the enemy. I know he tricked you for it. I know that you're paying so many consequences for one action. But through me, Jesus, I'm bringing redemption. I'm going to give you exactly the dominion that was lost. And so what that means for you and I, more than 2,000 years later, so it's not flashback anymore, it's back to the future. Is is that, no? Okay, cool. Stay with me still. (laughs) So you and I, on the other side of the finished work of the cross, we get to have access to everything that pertains to life and godliness. The word tells us, it says that he has given us, you and me, every single thing that we need that pertains to life and godliness, that we could live a God kind of life, that we could live the Zoe kind of life, that we could live a life that is liberated. We could live a life that is a life in the spirit that has no consequences of untimely death. In fact, we don't even get to taste death when we leave this earth. Death lost its sting because of the finished work of the cross. We literally leave from here and we're translated straight into glory. So death was your sting. But on this earth, in this life, we have everything that we need, that we would be fruitful, that we would multiply, that we would subdue the earth, that we would have dominion. How do I know Jesus gave you dominion? I don't want to lie to you, okay? So in the word, it tells us in my God, Help me, Lord. In Matthew, Matthew 16, Jesus very clear, clearly tells us that he actually got to a place where he possessed the keys. He says, I've got the keys. I, I'm, I've got the keys of the kingdom. And then he looks 
to the disciples, which essentially were in proxy for you and I. And he says, now I'm giving you the keys. You get to loose on the earth what is loosed in heaven and you get to bind on the earth what will be bound in heaven. In other words, he says, yes, I have the keys, but right now I know for so long you prayed through the prophets, your ancestors prayed through the prophets, but now you get to have a real encounter and a real engagement through me, Jesus, your Savior. And by the power of the Holy Spirit who reveals all truth to us, you and I get to loose on the earth and bind on the earth what is loosed in heaven and bound in heaven. So that's what it is. We have authority. And now, in John... As part of the teachings that Jesus was teaching us, he said in John 8, and most of us know the passage that says, and then you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. But just before that, there's a preceding text and it says the following. And then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. So what's a very crucial component here? It's to abide in the word. It's to not let anybody pull a fast one on you. It's to not let, even as I'm speaking to you, I want you to go home, take down whatever passages I shared with you. Take all of those down. You go home and investigate. Was she saying what was true? Or was she just trying to flatter me? Was she just talking because she can? She's just talking because there's a mic. I want you to go investigate, learn, get to hear from the scripture. Because it's not if you abide in the word of another. It's if you abide in his word. Then you're his disciples and you will know the truth. You'll actually not know it through your head. But you get to experience it when you choose to follow what it commands. To follow what it instructs. Now, concerning the offering. You might ask, okay, then I know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Okay, fantastic, I hear what you're saying. I love what men of God, and including our bishop, have actually coined. And this is what they said, which is essentially from Scripture itself, but the way they phrased it is in a language that I think you and I will fully understand. They say, whatever area in our lives that we lack knowledge in, whatever area it is, we actually have given the enemy full reign, full access to dominate. Whatever area in our lives where we choose to live in ignorance, whatever area in our lives where we're choosing not to abide in that word, we can't know the truth and the truth can't make us free. Yeah? And so for every single one of us, if you wonder, what does this have to do with my offering? There's a passage that's been shared from this platform, and I have to reiterate it. It's from 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. It tells us that God is able to make all grace abound towards you. God is able to make all grace. That means he can empower you. With everything you need, he's able to make all grace abound toward you. That you may have access, you actually can have the ability to engage in every good work. Not just know about it, not just hear someone tell you about it on a Wednesday, a Friday, a Sunday, a Thursday. It doesn't matter what day of the week. It's not only that you would hear about it, but that you would truly possess, attain every single thing that he has laid aside for you and I to have child of God. And there are very they're short, very, very brief, quick keys that I want to share with us tonight as to how do we even begin to engage in that abounding in every good work. What do we do? Where do I begin? The first thing, and don't take it lightly, is to believe. To truly believe because it is easy when we find ourselves in these spaces and these hubs to believe, oh, geez, I am going to walk in the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Yes, my God is for me to sing the songs, to, to dance the dances and to say the things. And then when you walk out, what then? What happens when 
opposition is right here, when everything is staring at you in the face. Well, there's a passage in the Word in Isaiah 7 where there was a king who was being conspired against by two other kings. And man, these guys were out to get him. They were like, listen, we're going to destroy him. We're going to get rid of him. They were conspiring. It was a real plan. There was real imminent threat. But the Lord sends a message through his prophet and he says, listen, I need you to go speak to that guy. Let him know. He doesn't have to worry about those two burnt out embers. That's what the Bible says. Tell him not to worry about those two burnt out embers. Basically, I've taken care of them. These are the last kicks of a dying horse. But he says the following words as he concludes. If your faith is not established, or if your faith is not firm, I cannot make you stand firm. The almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, he looks to him and he says, listen, I've made it happen. I've taken care of it for you. But if your faith does not, if your faith is not firm, if your faith is not established, if you're not sinking those shoes, those heels, digging those heels deep and saying, I am not moving I am choosing to expect to see his goodness. If you can't do that, I, sovereign as I am, I can't make you stand firm. There's a reason why we believe this. There's a reason why we are people who become people of the kingdom. There's a reason why we're born again. It is a process of laying aside whatever feels convenient in the moment. It is a process of laying aside whatever I've come to know. God, yes, you know exactly where I come from. You knew exactly where I'd be born. But you said if I would choose, if I would choose you, if I would choose to lock eyes with you, if I would choose to expect from you, if I would choose to lean into you, if I would choose to believe your word, God, you said then I will know the truth through experience, through revelation. I will know it. I won't just know it in my head. I'll walk it. I'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And so it doesn't matter what feels like it is is, is, is the temporary circumstance. It doesn't matter, and it's not because God doesn't care about it. It's because he's made you something else. It's because he's made you a warrior. It's because he's made you so much greater, so much more powerful. He's put on the inside of you every single thing that you need pertaining to life and godliness. And so, you and I have to determine that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living come what may. Not one day when I'm in heaven in the land of the living. I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord. I'll tell you, listen, NXT... And every single person who's an NXT member, or maybe you're just peeking in who's watching. Let me tell you, things are subject to change. The Bible tells us that whatever we we see is temporary. And we have to fix our eyes and concentrate our attention on the things that are eternal. That means whatever the situation looks like right now, I don't conform to it. I don't doubt it's there. I don't like try to overlook, oh, geez, it really is it? Come on, it's there. But it doesn't get to dictate what I will expect. It doesn't get to dictate who my God is. It doesn't get to dictate what my future is going to look like. But right here, right now, in my youth or in my experience stage, doesn't matter. The way things are today, the things that I see today aren't what's going to actually play out in the future. What's going to play out in the future is the very expectation that I have, the very things that the Lord said are going to happen in my life, the very things that he said, if you would engage one, two, three, you'll see X, Y, Z. Those things are what I will see. But that comes through engagement as well. So the second part of it, as I mentioned, is engaging. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the very chapter that I was talking about, because in verse 8 it tells us how God's able to make all grace abound towards us. In verse 6, before we get to the all grace being made to abound towards us, that we can have all that we need for every good work. In verse 6, 
it talks about how we choose to engage in sowing, how we choose to engage in giving. And that is generously and cheerfully. That is generously and cheerfully. I'm always convicted, the writer of that. I'm always convicted when I realize that when Paul said, because there's a song we sing about it, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, okay? When Paul was writing that passage of scripture, he was in chains. Always convicts me, a guy who is, this is not some cushy prison like some people experience these days. This isn't like that. This was some hardcore jail time. And he says, oh, always be full of joy in the Lord. Because there's something he understood about his God. There's something he understood. He's the same person who said the very God who began a good work in you is going to see it to completion. And so that person says, always be full of joy. So 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 tells us we have to engage, but there's an attitude with which we engage, and that is cheerful and generously. So I'm not always living, looking, and waiting to see, oh, geez, how quickly is that going to run out? But here's the third part, and I've touched on it, and it ties in very well. It's to live with expectation. In Proverbs 23 verse 18, in the Amplified Classic, it says, For surely there is a latter end, a future and a reward, and your hope and expectation shall not be cut off. I remember reading one translation. I have no idea which one it is, but I read it and I held on to it. It said there is a hereafter. There's a hereafter. I'm not talking about heaven one day. There's a tomorrow, which is a hereafter. There's Sunday, which is a hereafter. There's Monday, which is a hereafter. There are so many, you know, coming days and coming moments which are a hereafter. And if you choose to maintain your expectation like a dog with a bone, you will not have your hope cut off. So today, as we give, and from this moment onwards, I want us to engage in giving, number one, believing with our whole hearts and putting our reliance not on anything else, but on Him, on our God, the one who starts and completes and completes what it starts. I want us to engage with faith, to believe Him with our everything. But also as we engage, we engage wholeheartedly cheerful, wholeheartedly generous, and also wholeheartedly expecting to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So where you are, if you're watching, the details are going to come on your screen. Where you are, if you want an envelope, you can lift your hands and the ushers will give you an envelope. And to every person who's connecting on TV, there are details on your screen. As you choose to engage in giving with your whole heart believing, with your whole heart completely engaging with cheerfulness, with your whole heart completely expectant for a harvest, I want you to never, ever limit God. When Jesus said it is finished, there is not a single area of our lives that is exempt from his redemption. There is not a single area of our lives that is exempt from his redemption. Nothing is unredeemable. Nothing has to stay the way that it is. And even if it's great, it can be greater. Nothing has to stay the way that it is. There's a hereafter, but live with expectation. I want you to hold your seed in your hand right now. Father, I thank you for every single sower who is in this place and is connecting online. God, I thank you, whether they're watching now live or they're watching days, months, years later. 
Lord, the very words that you spoke when you said that you're the kind of God who finishes, who completes what he starts. And also when Jesus said those words that it is finished concerning our lives, I thank you, God, that even the area of our finances was taken care of. And so as we choose to engage you in accordance to your word, by giving cheerfully, by giving generously, we thank you, my God, that you will make all grace abound toward us, that we will be empowered, we will live lives of empowering, that we would step into the fullness of all that you have for us. God, I thank you right here, right now. We're not looking at the gifts. We're looking at the giver and we thank you that good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will come and will be poured out onto our bosom from many sources, others that we couldn't even anticipate. And Lord, I thank you that what it looks like today isn't what it will always be, but the life of the righteous is growing brighter and brighter. It is getting greater. It is getting more glorious in the name of Jesus. And so we give you our offering. We give you our seed, most capable God with joy in our hearts, with thanksgiving in our hearts. And we thank you, Lord, that what you have spoken concerning us shall be. And that is it. It is finished in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as you come so, I want you to exercise your cheerful giving. If you've got two left feet, it's all right. I want you to exercise your cheerful giving. Dance, praise, sing to him. Give him your best as you engage with your best attitude. Amen.
final say. The final say. Who has the final say? Who has the final say? Who has the final say? Oh, Who has the final say? Who has the final say? Who has the final say?
Amen. You may have your seats, NXT. Hallelujah. I want to welcome everyone once again to the NXT Awakening. Amen. Come on. I am so excited and expectant for tonight. So I just want to encourage you from the onset, just get your heart ready and get that expectation stirring on the inside of you to receive something. Because let me tell you something, the Lord will meet you at that point of expectation, always. And I declare that your expectation tonight shall not be cut off in the name of Jesus. We are believing God for an awakening in the lives of the young people. We are believing God for an awakening for everyone watching online. We want to see you in the comment section this evening. Engage with us. Everyone watching on Link FM, welcome. This is the NXT Awakening. I'm going to minister on a message that I prepared in January. And it has been bubbling and stirring in my heart. And that is a message on the blood of Jesus. It is so important because we're still in the beginning of the year to have a revelation of the blood of Jesus, the power of the blood of Jesus, and what the blood of Jesus actually carries in our life. Amen? A lot of people claim they are covered by the blood of Jesus, but you're still living a crazy life. Maybe you're living in lack. Maybe you're living in sickness. Maybe you're living in poverty, disease, sin, rebellion, lust, whatever it is. But I want to tell you that Jesus died for all those things for once and for all. Amen? And just as sacrifices, there were sacrifices made in the Old Testament, Jesus gave his life and shed his blood to reconcile us from sin back to the Father. By the blood of Jesus, we access many things that we'll get into tonight. But that blood of Jesus reconciled us back to the Father. And the Bible says in 1 John 1 verse 7, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If I am walking in the light, if I am saved and I have fellowship and I have relationship with God, I am walking in everything that the Lord has in store for me. And the blood of Jesus, His Son cleanses us from all sin. Because we were cleansed from all sin at the cross on Calvary, we can have fellowship with the Lord. Amen? We can walk out of darkness, young people, into His marvelous light. 
because of that sacrifice that was made. There is power in the blood of Jesus. And what does the Bible say about the blood of Jesus? In the Old Testament, it was only through the shedding of blood in animal sacrifices that man could be cleansed from sin. And the, what it says in Leviticus 17 verse 11, it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Now you've probably heard that word and you're like, I don't know what that means. I'm going to tell you. Atonement, the action of making amends of a wrong. So the blood of Jesus was that atonement. The animal sacrifices in the Old Testament was that atonement for the wrongs that was happening, for the impurity that was happening, for the disgusting lives the people was, were living. It was the atonement for that. And I love what Hebrews 9 verse 12 to 14 says, and I want you to highlight it in your Bible. Because I read it recently, and I was like, Oh Lord, this is so good. It says, with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once and for all, once and for all time and secured our redemption forever. And under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think. How much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sin. Now what this is telling us is there is power in the blood of Jesus and specifically in there's power in the blood of Jesus and we should not put our hope, our trust, our faith in the blood of animals. Amen? In the blood of calves, in the blood of bulls, not the blood of goats. Jesus died for all of that. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciousness, sinful deeds, so that we can worship the living God. And that got me thinking, if my mind is not purified and my conscience is not clear and I'm in worship, I'm not worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. Because there's a, there's, worship is complete devotion unto God. It's giving all your attention unto Him. Devotion is not about us. It is about glorifying God always. And I love what it says here, so that we may worship the living God. So that we may worship the living God for the power of eternal spirit. Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. And this evening I want to give you five benefits of the blood of Jesus. Number one, Pastor Tando spoke about this. The blood of Jesus brings redemption. Redemption is an act of saving or being saved from our sin, error, or evil. It, it brings redemption. The only way to redeem humanity is through the blood of Jesus. And redeem means to rescue. And I believe that the Lord rescued us. Amen. We have to understand that there is a cost implied in redemption and that the price was so high no one else could pay it I mean when I think of everything Jesus went through when I think of the sweat that turned into blood he knew that it was going to be a hefty price that he was going to have to pay for each and every one of us but we were the joy set before him he redeemed us back to the Father. He rescued us back to the Father. He saved us from error and sin. He saved us. What is the purpose of the blood of Jesus? The fall in the Garden of Eden created a division between man and God. From that point, we were separated from our Creator. And you know, when I was reading this, and I was preparing for this. I thought of the message Pastor uh, Prophet Elise shared during Revival 9.0, where he said that God 
just wanted to restore us back to the glory. He wanted to restore us back to fellowship and relationship with him. And every single person in the Old Testament, they'd come, they'd get it wrong. They'd come, the devil will come and creep in and cause chaos. But what he wanted ultimately through Noah, through Moses, through many other people was to restore the glory he wants us to carry his glory. Amen. And the Bible says in Hebrews 9 verse 22. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The blood would serve as an atonement, a covering for our sins. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. In him we have redemption through his blood. Amen? Number one, the blood of Jesus brings redemption. Number two, Jesus' blood is our ticket to boldly enter God's presence. How amazing is that, NXT? Can I hear you tonight? How amazing is that? Hebrews 10, verse 19 to 22, but I'm just going to read verse 19. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure power and water. Amen. He paved the way for us to have a relationship with the Lord, complete relationship and fellowship. Amen. It was through that sacrifice that we're able to have fellowship with the Lord. And when you think of fellowship, it's spending time with someone. It's having a good relationship with someone or something. It's closeness. It's a friendship. That's what we have with God, with Jesus. And it was bought with a price. I think it's so important to remind yourself every single day, to remind yourself before you spend your money on loose living, to remind yourself before you go on that website, hey, I was bought with a price. Is this going to bring God glory? Is my actions going to bring God glory because I was bought with a hefty price? Think about that. I want to challenge you every single day. Before you do something contrary to the word of God, before you are nasty to someone, before you say something you don't mean, think about the price that was paid for you. Amen? Amen. Number three, we speak about this a lot. Through the blood of Jesus, we are healed. We receive divine healing through his blood. And the Bible says in Isaiah 53 verse 5, with his stripes, we are healed. With his blood, we have been healed. Had there been no blood in those stripes, would there have been healing? I don't think so. It is that blood that flowed from the, from the body of Jesus that caused us to live in divine healing. That blood of Jesus as he was beaten, broken, bruised, stripes on his back. It was that blood that caused us to live in divine healing. And sickness is from the enemy, I believe it. God does not want us to be sick. He does not want us to be ridiculed with disease. He wants us to be our best. He wants us to be healthy. He wants us to be active. He wants us to go ye therefore to all the nations and proclaim the good news of Jesus and baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sickness is there to cripple you from the assignment God has for you. Amen. God is the author of health. 
He is not the author of disease. He healed the woman who Satan had bound for 18 years. He cast out spirits with one word. He healed all that were oppressed of the devil. He commanded the unclean spirit to come out. He rebuked the fever. When the paralytic was brought to Jesus, he healed his body. And many people today whose sins have already been forgiven still have infirmities of the flesh and are suffering from disease. But Jesus commanded us to be free. He forgives our sins and he frees us from disease. He makes our body whole. It is your privilege in God, not only to be saved, but to be cleansed from sin and to have healing and divine health in your body. Amen. The thing is, a lot of the time, we, ra- we lack the revelation. If I'm reading scripture and God is telling me, Jesus bore our sins, Jesus died so that I may have life and have it more abundantly. Because of those stripes on Jesus' back, I now do not have to live in sickness. And by his stripes, I am healed. That is a revelation. That should mean something to you. And the thing is, most of us, we lack that revelation, which means we are also going to lack application. Do you hear me, NXT? Because if I have the revelation, I am going to apply it in my life. If the Bible says we are healed, my application is going to be declaring healing over my body even when I don't feel well. The application is going to be prayer and fasting. The application is going to be fellowship with the Lord. Amen. Revelation and application will cause success in your life. And it will cause you to walk in complete victory in the name of Jesus. And I want to challenge you. As you receive revelation, it doesn't have to be pertaining to the blood of Jesus or healing. Whichever area in your life where there is application, revelation, there will be application. Amen. Number four, there is protection through the blood of Jesus. Exodus 12 verse 13, I'm not going to be too long here. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Back in the Old Testament, the 10th plague came. And the Lord was basically killing the firstborns, right? Because of Pharaoh. Pharaoh didn't want to let people, God's people go. And God said, you know what? You leave me no choice. I'm going to smite all the firstborns. But God gave the, his people an instruction. He said, you will put blood of a lamb on a doorpost and the angel of death that is supposed to come and kill the firstborn will pass over you. And we have that protection today through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Number five, and this is my last point, authority over the devil through the blood of Jesus. Revelation 12 verse 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Testimony. Now who is him? It is Satan. It is the adversary. We overcame him completely by the blood of the lamb and our testimony. And what does that mean? I love what a man of God says. His name is Derek Prince. He puts it very plainly and very boldly to us. He says, we overcome Satan when we testify personally to what the word of God says and to what the blood of Jesus does for us. Now, because Jesus shed his blood for us, I have a testimony I have a testimony to say, Jesus heals, Jesus saves, Jesus transforms, Jesus renews, Jesus comforts. I have the victory because of that blood of Jesus. I carry a testimony because of the blood of Jesus. And because I carry that testimony, people will marvel. People will be drawn to me. And not just because of me and my testimony, it is the testimony of the blood of Jesus. That is the most single most important thing. The testimony of the blood of Jesus and what that blood of Jesus has done in my life, in your life, in the lives of people watching online and at home. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. God is so good. With his blood, Jesus purchased our authority and deliverance. The blood broke addictions. It breaks spiritual bondages. And it subdues the work of the enemy. When we testify of the word of the blood, we exercise our faith, our authority over the enemy. Amen. Can we stand in this place? Hallelujah. Vocals, can I have you with me? It is by that blood of Jesus, young people, that we can boldly enter the throne of grace. It is by the blood of Jesus that we have victory. It is by the blood of Jesus and the price that was paid that I can stand here more than a conqueror. Because I, because you are the joy set before him. The blood of Jesus still carries and will always carry power, young people. I want that to become a revelation to you tonight. Hallelujah. Let's go into a time of worship. Thank you, Jesus. It reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the
Just pray in the spirit softly now. She come brandala ya kia lekete. She bandala ya mbrondeli ya tia kate. She kendeli andala ya talia koto. The blood will never lose its power. She kembri andala ya tia kele. She bandoro kalia barianda tia tale. She kembre tele ki andada ya tia kade. She prendeli ya tala katia kata. Come on, may the blood become so real to you now. There's a price that was paid for you in XD. Oh, Shaya Branda Yata Yakadam, Lekendil Yakadam, Sheke Bretelekede. Begin to thank Jesus now for the price that was paid. Fix your eyes on Jesus and thank Him for the price that was paid. There was a price that was paid for you. Father, I love you. Jesus, I thank you for the price that was paid for me. I love you. I give my life to you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. Take a few moments and just thank Jesus. Just thank him. He's the king that died for you. A king that bled from you. He took the form of a human so that he could pay a price for each and every single one of us. He paid a price that we could not pay. Thank him now. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We bless your name. Thank you for the ultimate price that was paid. He was the ultimate sacrifice. There was no, there's no more long, there's no need for animals anymore. He's the ultimate sacrifice. You don't need the blood of sheep, of bulls, of pigeons, of doves. No, today you have the blood of Jesus that washes you, that cleanses you, that sets you free. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Amen. Matthew 26, verse 39. Thank you, Ben. Matthew 26, verse 39. This is Jesus speaking. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. See, here's the thing. Jesus knew what was about to come. He knew what he had to endure. He knew the price that he had to pay. Yet he said to God, not my will be done, but your will be done, Father. He was obedient up to the point of death. He is the standard for Christian living. Jesus, the King, our Messiah, our first Love. May we never, ever forget the price that was paid for us. It was a high price that was paid for each and every one of us. May we never become familiar with the blood of Jesus. May we always approach it with reverence, with honor, 
and respect for our king. Amen. The difference between the Old Testament sacrifices and Jesus is that the Old Testament sacrifices, they were not willing. But Jesus was willing to die for you so that we can have fellowship with God. This is the main difference. If you take an animal and you want to slaughter them, man, they're making a noise, they're going on, you have to keep them under the control. But Jesus, he willingly laid his life down for you. Willingly. No one had to force him. He didn't need to be bound. He willingly laid his life down for you. Do you know it's so significant there were at least 300 prophecies concerning the death of Jesus. At least 300 prophecies. And he filled each and every single one of them. Therefore, that means that God always had a plan to redeem us back to him. So that we can have fellowship with God. You see, we lost this fellowship. My wife is speaking about it. We lost this fellowship with God through Adam and Eve. When they sinned, we lost this fellowship. And he came to restore that fellowship. Jesus said that he's the truth, the way, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus speaking. The only way to God is through Jesus. There are no shortcuts. Hinduism, Muslim, all these other religions... Man, you get famous people, they say there are many ways to God. <laughs> but Jesus said that He is the truth, the way, and the life. He is the door. He is the gate. If you understand the tabernacle, you understand that there's one, one gate on the east side in order to go into the tabernacle. Jesus is that gate. There is only one way to God, and that is through Jesus. But that was just my introduction. <laughs> my title for my, for my message today is The Life That I Now Live. Galatians 2, with 2 verse 20. Turn there for me in your Bibles. Galatians 2 verse 20. I encourage you guys to take notes tonight. It's very important that you take notes. Amen. Galatians 2 verse 20. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. And he says... I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So the Apostle Paul is speaking here. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Turn with me to Mark 8, verse 34. Mark 8, verse 34. Galatians 2, verse 20 is the foundational text for tonight. So turn with me to Mark 8, verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, Jesus speaking, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So here we see the same way that Jesus took up his cross is the same way that each and every one of us have to take up our cross. There is a price to following Jesus. Following Jesus isn't this this fun thing that we do. It's not because it's a vibe or because my friends are going to church, so now I'll go to church. No. He says that you must deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. This is why the Apostle Paul could say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Someone say, no longer. You see, Jesus set the example for us to follow. Therefore, we must follow this example that he set for us. Amen? Now, there might not be a literal cross that you need to carry or thorns that you need to put on your head but it can look different for each and every single one of us. There are things that we need to let go of. 
our culture, our traditions, the way that we think, whatever we think that is right, we need to let go of it and look to Jesus and follow Jesus and Jesus alone. He is the reason why we are here tonight. It's all about Jesus. He's the one that prayed, that paid the price for you. It's all about the King. If it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't be here tonight. You wouldn't have access to God. But He made a way where there was no way. Amen? Amen. Jesus paid a price, therefore we must pay a price. We must deny ourselves and pick up a cross. So what does that mean? What does that look like? We have to come to the end of ourselves. Joshua Salman, he said this, unbelievers, they fight with sin. Believers, they fight with self. This is why it's very important that we must get rid of ourselves. Who is more real to you? Is Jesus more real to you? We are called to imitate Christ. We can't do that in our own strength. We can't do that in our own self. We're thinking this is right, that is right. No, you have to lay your life down. The same way Jesus laid his life down for you. The same way that you must lay your life down for him. If you want to make impact in this world, you have to lay your life down for God. You want to do mighty things for God, you must lay your life down before Him. Lay your life down. And here's the thing. It's not a nice thing to hear because we are comfortable in our own lives. We like to watch the Netflix and play games and do everything that, that our flesh likes. Our flesh doesn't like laying our life down so that we can pick up our cross. But let me tell you tonight, it's necessary. If you want to be the same like Apostle Paul and say, I have been crucified with Christ. Some would say there is a price to pay. Galatians 5 verse 24. It says, and those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Let me read that again. And those who belong to Christ. Do you belong to Christ? Are you one of those who belong to Christ? Because they have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. With its passions and its desires. What are your, pas your passions and your desires that need to be crucified with you so that you can come to the end of yourself? God has ordained you to do mighty things. He wants to work in you and then through you. God can't work through you if He hasn't worked on the inside of you first. But we must allow God to work on the inside of us so that He can work through us. He goes on to say, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Once we crucify ourselves, we can confidently say that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Here's the thing. When you get born again, when you get saved, people shouldn't remember you anymore. Your old friends, they should not remember you anymore. Even old family members who maybe knew you in the past, who knew you back then. Because here's the thing, if you still look the same like you did before you got saved, there's something wrong. Something needs to change on the inside of you. You are washed by the blood of Jesus. You have been separated from your sin. The blood of Jesus empowers you. There, some would say there is power in the blood of Jesus. There is power mighty power in the blood of Jesus. When he died for you, that means, and when he died for you and you accepted him as Lord and Savior, that means that you are now covered by the blood of Jesus. I'm not going to explain this. My wife explained this. You are now covered by the blood of Jesus. 
you are separated from your sin. But it's up to you to stop sinning. God can't stop sinning for you. You see, this is why the cross must become so real to us, so that we will not fall for sin. And here's the thing, people think of sin as this big thing, killing someone, things like that. If you look at someone wrong, if you gossip, it's a sin. There's no levels when it comes to sin. Sin is sin. And Jesus died on that cross because of our sin so that we can be washed clean, so that we can be washed as white as snow. Amen? 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, and it says, And we all, someone say we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is spirit. Here it says that as we behold God, we are being transformed from one degree to another. We are being transformed. This is why I said you can't look the same that you did once you are now saved. People might come to you and say, man, why are you going to church all the time? What's wrong with you? What are you doing in that place? <laughs> you are being transformed. You are reading the word of God. They ask you, why are you always quoting scripture for everything? Because that's all that's on the inside of you. Nothing else needs to come, up, nothing else needs to come out of you. When you are squeezed, what's coming out of you? Is the word of God coming out of you? Or are you complaining? Is your opinions coming out? Here's the thing. You can build someone up because you have the word of God on the inside of you. When they are going through difficult situations, when they are going through something, can you build them up? Do you have a word for them? Do you have a word for yourself? Whatever you are going through, it, is, it can be founded in the Word of God. Anything, might it, it might be financial, it might be mental health. Man, you have the mind of Christ, but do you receive it? Have, has the cross become so real to you that you don't have to deal with everything else? Has, man, this is my intention tonight, that the cross might become more real to you than anything else that it might become more real to you than the person sitting next to you. That it will become so real to you. That when you wake up in the morning, you just thank Jesus out of love, out of the price that he has paid for you. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you. You are almighty God. I thank you for dying on that cross for me. Therefore, I will crucify myself. I will come to the end of myself so that you can use me mightily. Let me tell you, God wants to use you mightily in this generation. But will you crucify yourself, your passions with your desires? Here's the thing, when you are young, you want to do many things. You want to experience many things. All you need to do is experience the presence of God. There's an empty void on the inside of each and every one of us. And no substance, no sleeping around, no nothing, no amount of fame, no amount of followers on Instagram, on Facebook, whatever. Nothing can fill that empty void on the inside of you. It is only Jesus. He is the missing piece to your life. If you don't have Jesus, you're always going to feel lost. You're always going to feel like you're not doing enough. You're always going to feel like, you're unfulfilled. I know what it feels like. I had a life without Jesus, and it was bad. But when I met Jesus, when I had an encounter with God, everything changed for me. I found my purpose, and I found my first love. Is Jesus still your first love? You've been born again. You've been saved for five years, 10 years, 20 years. I don't care. 
Is Jesus still your first love? Do you still love him like you did back then? You should actually be loving him more now than what you did back then because you are in fellowship with God. Because as you are reading the word of God, you see, oh man, man, God is so wonderful. Oh God, you are mighty. You become more intimate with God. You can't be on the same level that you have been operating at for the last month, for the last week, for the last day. You should always be growing in intimacy with God, becoming one with God each and every single day. Starving your flesh, reading the Word of God. You see, as nice as it is coming here to NXT, watching online, you should be someone that reads the Word of God that gets into the Word of God yourself. The Bible calls us, calls us a king priest. We are a king and we are a priest. Let me tell you, a priest, they know the Bible. Do you know the, your Bible? You don't have to know the full scanning of Scripture, but you have, to con, you have to continue growing in the Word. You're always continuing growing in the Word of God, Gaining substance. When you go home, you're spending time with God. As you are here, you sit and you're making notes. You're going back. What is it that Keegan said about Galatians 2 verse 20? You're going into the Word of God. You don't understand something in Scripture. You are doing Bible study. You are now gaining substance. Jesus himself knew the Word. He was found in the temple when he was 12 years old. He knew the word. Because when the enemy comes, what are you going to do? Are you going to complain? Are you going to run away? Or are you going to confess the word of God? Because that's what Jesus did. When the enemy came to him, he said, It is written. It is written. You have been bought with a high price. You are valuable to God. You think that you are nothing. You think that you are nobody. Let me tell you, God loves you so much that he sacrificed Jesus for you, the son in whom he was well pleased. You are valuable. You think you are not good enough. You have an identity issue. Do you know the price that was paid for you? A high price that was paid for you. You need to die to the opinion of man and come to God. Read the word of God. Dive into the word of God. Stay in the word of God. Pastor Nal says this, we begin, we start, and we end in the word of God. Simple. That should be your life. That should be your every single day. You are in the word of God. You are growing. You're growing in substance. You are growing in stature. You are being transformed from one degree to another. Each and every single day, you are conforming to the image of God. You are being transformed. He goes on to say, And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. (laughs) The life that you are now living? Are you living this life in the faith of the Son of God? The Word of God tells us that the just shall live by faith. Not faith in yourself, not faith in your church, not faith in your pastor, faith in the Son of God, the one that paid the price for you. Here's the thing, though you might be living from the, you might be living in the flesh. Here's the thing, you can't get rid of your flesh. Your flesh is your flesh. This is your license to be in here on earth. You can't get rid of it. But the one thing that you can do is that you can crucify your flesh. But here's the thing, we should not be living from our flesh, our desires, our passions. We should be living from our spirit, our inner man. In the beginning, Adam, he lived from the spirit to the soul and then the flesh. 
Today we live from the flesh to the soul to the spirit. This is why we are not operating the way that we're supposed to operate as kingdom ambassadors, as kings of the kingdom of God. Jesus said that he is the king of kings. Who are those kings? We are those kings. He is the big, the capital K king. We are the small letter K king. The king of kings. Therefore, are you operating as a king here on this earth? <laughs> or are you just messing around, living a mediocre life? This is not the life that God has called you to live. He has called you to live and operate as a king here on this earth. But you won't know that unless you go into the word of God. As you dive into the word of God. As you see, my God, what is it that you are saying? How is it that I should operate? Listen to me. The same way that Jesus operates is the same way that we can operate today here on this earth. The same way that you operated back then is the same way that we can operate now. Getting people saved, getting people healed, preaching the word of God. This is, man, the word Christian means followers of Christ or little anointed ones. You are anointed. A Christian is not just a title. It's a life being crucified and following Jesus, the King, the Messiah. Therefore, our senses should not control the way we live, but the Word of God should control the way that we live. This is why it's very important to get into the Word of God. Everything that we read in the Word of God must be applied. When you are reading the Word of God, you are gaining knowledge. When you are studying the Word of God, you are now gaining understanding. But when you apply the Word of God application, that is now wisdom. You now begin to operate like a king. Someone say, I'm a king. That's for you women as well. Amen. You are a king in the eyes of God. 1 John 4 verse 9. 1 John 4 verse 9. And it says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Someone say, through Him. That we might live through Him. We are not called to live our own lives. We are called to live through Jesus. We can live a successful life through Jesus, not in our own way, not in our own understanding, through Jesus alone. The end of Galatians 2 verse 20, it says, or let me read it from the beginning. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Listen to this. Who loved me and gave himself for me. God displayed how much he loved us. Jesus displayed how much he loved us by giving himself for you for each and every single one of us say Jesus come on say it louder Jesus, Jesus died for me may that become real to you tonight that Jesus died for me it said who loved me and gave himself for me therefore if we love God we will do the same thing that Jesus did. He gave his life away. Therefore, we need to come to the end of ourselves and give our life to God. Remember, Jesus set the standard for us. He loved us and he gave himself for us. Therefore, if we love him, we will give our life to him. There is no greater love than this. He displayed his love for us by sacrificing his love for each and every single one of us. He displayed his love for us. He didn't just say, man, Charlize, I love you. Kendra, I love you. Tariq, I love you. Pastor Edward, I love you. No, he displayed his love by giving his life for us. 
may we get to the point where we don't just say, I love God, but we display it in our lives. May your life reflect your love for God. We have to sacrifice our lives for Him because we love Him. Not for anything else, but because we love Him. Romans 5 verse 8, it says, But God shows us His love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. Here's the thing. Each and every one of us were once a sinner. We are now a saint. You are a sinner. We were born in sin because of the sin that took place in the Garden of Eden. And everything after that. Man, I know in my own personal life, I did bad things. Yet, Jesus died for me while I was a sinner. He died for you while he was a sinner. What type of love is this? We can't comprehend this love that God has for us. And I believe tonight that he is calling you deeper. I hope that the cross is becoming very real to you. Therefore, I have two questions for you. Is your life a reflection of the price that was paid for you? Let that sink in. Is your life a reflection of the price that was paid for you? And the second question, what is the response to the price that was paid for you? The response, now you have to act upon it. You know what Jesus did for you. You know the price that was paid for you, but now you have to act upon it. This is why Galatians 2 verse 20 is the foundational text. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 to 15. The vocals, you guys may come up. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Pastor Nell said this a few weeks ago, settle in yourself that it was really settled on the cross. Therefore, what was settled on the cross, we need to settle it in our own lives. It must become real to us. We can't deal with things that Jesus has died for. We can't deal with things that Jesus has died for. The cross is the main thing. To conclude, live for the one that has died for you. Don't live for anyone else. Don't live for yourself. Don't live for the opinions of man. Don't live for influences that you will never meet one day. For followers, you have 1,000, 10,000 followers. But are you influencing them correctly? The same way that Jesus influenced everyone who followed him. Are you influencing people the correct way? God has entrusted you with people around your life. Each and every single one of us, we have our own ministry. Whether you're at school, whether it's your family, whether it's your friends, you have your own ministry. Are you influencing them or are they influencing you? Live for the one that has died for you. We're going to go into a time of praise and worship. And while we are singing, I want you to give your all to God. Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This life that I now live, I live in the faith of the Son of Man who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. Can we all just stand as we go into a time of worship? I pray that each and every one of you guys 
God something tonight. This is not my opinion. This comes from the Word of God. And it is our responsibility to apply the Word of God. Pastor Nell says this, that there is no Christianity without responsibility. We have to take responsibility concerning our life, concerning our decisions, concerning our destiny. Amen. Let us go into a time of worship. Come on, right where you are, begin to stir yourself up in the most holy faith. Begin to stir up an expectation tonight.
glory and honor and power dominion and all blessing be unto you O God to him whose eyes are blazing with fire to him whose hair is white as wool and from his mouth goes forth the sword and to him whose feet are brought we lift up that king whose feet, whose footstool is on earth, but he's seated in heaven. Iranda Kaperi Asali Adose, Embere Selete Kila Dahasia, Shalina Rebekeri Oseli Biriakaria, Ezila de Kinda Riasatele. Step into a world where faith meets convenience. Faith Know, your ultimate content experience. Stream faith-based goodness anytime, anywhere. No more imagining, we're already there. On-demand treasures, new gems each day. Thousands of hours, a wholesome display. Diverse content from every corner we glean. 